Good afternoon and um, welcome to uh, this afternoon's In Conversation with Rachel Hunter, the Director General of Prime Minister and Cabinet. Can I begin by acknowledging uh, that we're here on Turrbal and Yuggera land and can I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Can I also pay my respects to all First Nations people joining us online today and to uh, the traditional owners of all the lands you might be meeting us on from. Also, I'd, I'd just like to say how excited QCOS is about the 14th of October. We are really keen, keenly supporting the Yes campaign to ensure uh, that a First Nations voice to Parliament is enshrined in the Constitution and also we're fully supportive of the full implementation of the Uluru Statement from the Heart, including Truth and Treaty. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. It's going to be a wonderful conversation. I'm absolutely delighted to be here uh, with Rachel Hunter. Rachel is um, one of our most experienced public, service, um, public servants in Queensland and she has had a truly phenomenal career. Uh, in 1977, uh, Rachel was appointed as the first teacher at TAFE uh, Queensland and um, she went on to be appointed as the director of, of um, South Bank Institute of TAFE in 1998 and was also the chair of TAFE Queensland um, for, um, after that. From 2002 to 2003, Rachel was the Public Service Commissioner and then following that she was the first uh, non-legal Director General of the Department of Justice and Attorney General. In uh, 2006, Rachel became the Director General of the Department of Education, Training and the Arts and she actually oversaw the construction of GOMA. In 2010, at the age of 55, Rachel retired, saying that she wanted to spend uh, more time with her family and being uh, frivolous. I'm not sure how that's going, Rachel. Uh, since then, she's been the Director General of State Development, um, Manufacturing, Infrastructure and Planning. And can I say that was uh, when I first met Rachel uh, in my role as the CEO of QCOS. Uh, and I've got to say, uh, Rachel made such an impression on me the first time I met her. She made herself so available to me um, as the Director General at that time. But the other thing that was so remarkable uh, and has been remarkable every time I've met Rachel is that she has talked about the people around her and she is always celebrating and supporting um, people to come up um, and um, move forward in their career and um, just just such a generous um, leader. In uh, As the under-treasurer, uh, Rachel then became the under-treasurer of Queensland uh, from 2020 to 2021, so during COVID, and she's currently the Director General of Department of Premier and Cabinet, and she is the first woman who has held that role in its 164-year history. So, wow, what a wealth of experience um, and knowledge. It's uh, really exciting to have this conversation today. And really what we want to cover is um, both Rachel's reflections on leadership and how that's changed over time, the types of leaders that we need right now as um, people in our community are experiencing disadvantage in, uh, at, to levels that um, we, we probably haven't seen for a long time, uh, and also the role of um, premiers and cabinet and social policy and some of the, um, the, the impact the community services sector can have on shaping social policy. Uh, a few little um, quick housekeeping things. We are broadcasting in Zoom. We have received some wonderful pre-submitted questions. So um, thank you so much to people online who submitted those, but do send them through during our conversation because um, we are um, broadcasting live and I can see any questions that you send through and hopefully we might have time for some extra ones, but I'm not promising that. Also, this session is going to be recorded and um, we'll make it available after after today's session. So um, without further ado, I'm, I'm so pleased um, to have you here so. today, Rachel. And I might just start um, by asking you to reflect, uh, I guess, as such a trailblazer, um, uh, you know, the first female Director General in Department of Premier and Cabinet. I'm really interested to know from you, um, I guess as a girl and as a young woman um, at that time, 
how did you um, form the, 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 the view and the understanding that to be female and to be ambitious didn't have to be two different things? And obviously, other than your clear talent and hard work, what were those enablers of your success? Wow, that, um, thank you very much and hi everyone. Um, Amy, I don't think I ever saw myself as ambitious. So as a, as a child, a young girl, and as a maturing woman, the enduring role model for me in my life was my mum. And you know a bit about my mum's history. I've, I've talked to you about that previously. Mum was uh, an incredibly um, strong, um, courageous woman. Um, she had a hard life. Um, she worked most of her time uh, when I was a child as a housekeeper on properties. That was a mechanism to keep us together. Um, my father wasn't in my life from the time I was two. So I think what I learned from, from my mum's life was that the power of hard work, um, the, the resilience that comes with an optimistic worldview, you know, things will get better. Um, but also a sense that, and this is probably the, the, the less positive side, um, that you have to look after yourself. So how that translated for me um, into, you know, where I sit now is that um, you, you need to seize opportunity, you need to work hard, um, you need to bounce back, life always deals the hard knocks uh, and no one is immune to that and some people experience it far more than others. So I see myself as incredibly blessed to have had mum as my role model and to hopefully have instilled that same sense of value around hard work, resilience, um, but also draw on a set of values. Mum, um, while not a, necessarily a Christian woman, was a highly spiritual woman. Mm. And she believed that everybody contributed in some way to making things better for everyone else. So that power of the collective, of community, mum was in CWA, you know, she, she was a giver. And I think that um, for me, um, the, the, the question around ambition is less about, is this good for me, but am I good for others? So I think that's um, sort of where I wanted to go with the next question was then to sort of interrogate this idea that you, you, you haven't felt ambitious and yet um, you've had incredible success in your career and you've, you clearly must have wanted um, those things because you've worked so hard uh, for what you've got. So I guess when we think of ambition, um, it's about those, um, I guess, is it more about um, those values that you hold and um, wanting to seek opportunities to further those, to the further those values as opposed to a personal ambition about where you want to get to? Yeah, I think um, the word ambition gets a bad rap, doesn't it? Do you know that, you know, there's this notion of, you know, clawing your way, you know, over the bodies of others to get where you want to go. That's not how I see it. Um, ambition is about making a greater contribution and mm. it's about providing service to others, mm. both within the organisations you lead, but more broadly and importantly from a public service perspective to the communities you serve. Mm. And I've wondered about you when um, thinking about your leadership style and um, so you've spoken about that influence of your mother in terms of her um, having those clear values, having that optimistic outlook, but also being prepared um, for setbacks and having that resilience. You went on to study teaching and um, I wondered what influence um, having that teaching background has on you as a leader. And I, I wondered in terms of working um, with the people that you're supervising or mentoring, how that sort of education background might have influenced you as a leader. Yeah, so I, I um, um, went into teaching because I had had the benefit of, of many um, inspirational teachers impacting my life, but one teacher particularly. 
And I thought just how powerful that was, how powerful his influence was on me and the development of my self-belief as a learner um, and my self-esteem as a learner. And I wanted a part of that. I wanted to be in that place. And, you know, I, I went to UQ, did an arts degree, diploma of education. Um, but my journey was always in going to be into the secondary system. Mm -hmm. I ended up in the TAFE system, and that's another story. But teaching prepares you for um, a world where not everyone's the same. Mm. Um, you know, as teachers, we deal with learners who learn at different paces, are motivated by different things, different subjects, um, have all uh, at any time felt the insecurity of um, an inability to master subject matter or process. Um, and, the, you know, the job of teacher is a job of guide and mentor and cheerleader um, and, um, you know, you bring knowledge to the table, uh, but it's enabling people to develop a strong sense of self-mastery in terms of their learning. That ultimately, that's the goal. So if you translate that into a leadership context, um, that's exactly the way in which um, my mental model works. That leadership is it's a job around teams, building teams, mm -hmm. um, building diversity into the teams, ensuring that voices are heard, um, nurturing people's talents, growing an environment, a learning environment where people learn from each other, they're their own teacher and they teach others. That's what makes for a dynamic vibrant and sustaining organisation. Um, and, and the thing about that model is you have to let people go. Mm. You know, you, you, people grow and um, they, they morph their capabilities into new fields. So, you, you know, there's that constant churn, if you like, um, but that's the role of a leader, to let people go, to enable them to grow there, provide an environment where they grow their talents and and you know they move to other roles that um, are rewarding for them and I guess the other I guess a, a difference um, between a workplace and a classroom is that um, you know we're employed to do certain roles and hopefully those uh, roles bring out the best in us are suited to our particular skills and attributes um, and sometimes as a leader or a manager um, you might um, identify that someone isn't a good fit for the role. So, in a, which is different to a, a, a learning environment and an education sort of system where you're trying to assure that everybody has the opportunity to learn those things. How do you see your role as a leader when um, someone's perf performance isn't what it should be or you can see that they're not particularly well suited to the role that they're in? In a way, the, the analogy holds. Um, you know, there are always students who um, struggle um, in in a classroom, or they they they're not motivated by what they're hearing, what they're learning, um, and they're not performing. So feedback is the first responsibility of a leader mm. um, to sit down and talk with people. The same occurs in an organisation. Mm. You know, in the old days in the public service, people who underperformed were moved. Um, so they became someone else's problem. We, uh, as Directors General, have signed up to a stewardship value, stewardship of the public sector. And that means that high performance is recognised um, and poor performance is managed. And the mm. way you manage poor performance is to fundamentally believe that inherently people want to do a good job. I don't think anyone comes to work saying, I don't want to do a good job. So finding the, the basis for the underemployment, and if it's as simple as wrong fit, mm. and your skills are better here, people need the dignity of being told mm. that at this point they're not perceived to be performing. Mm. And these are the reasons, mm. and these are the things we can do to assist. So it's less about, um, you know, a, a, 
an assessment that you're not going to make it mm. and it's more about feedback to the effect that at this point you're not meeting the performance expectations for these reasons. Is there a reason? Mm. Listen to people. Mm. Um, but at some point, um, allowing underperformance to continue forces others to pick up the load mm. and there's a fairness issue mm. that has to be addressed. Mm. People yeah. find it hard to give performance feedback, incidentally. They, they'd struggle with it. Mm. Yeah, yeah, no, I've... And I think teaching helps you, again, yeah. a teaching background, because ultimately, um, teaching and learning result in grades of yes. some, some form or another. So I think that that certainly fits us well for those conversations. Mm. Yeah, so we should all go off and do teaching. Then. I think that's yeah. right. <laughs> So you talked before about um, sort of this um, kind of guiding framework that, you, that you've drawn from your mum, which is about um, having, you know, being willing to face a life that will include challenges, that will include setbacks. And, and yet in the face of that um, sort of pragmatic outlook, that you would hold firm to optimism, not a Pollyanna view of the world, but a view that uh, regardless of what confronts us, we have something within us that will en enable us to meet that moment. Can you give me some examples from your career where you've really felt that come to the fore, things, um, you know, some examples of really significant challenges that you've faced? Um, I think my first challenge, if I talk about, you know, my first job, um, which was um, taking up a role as a teacher of uh, what were then called liberal studies, but then became known as life skills, so communications, human relationships and um, work-related human movement in trade-based courses at Eagle Farm College of TAFE, which is a heavy industrial training college, TAFE college. Um, the first day I arrived, I was shown around the campus and it didn't take me long to realise that there were no women. Um, so I was 21. I was the first woman teacher appointed on staff. There were 100, about 120 men from memory as teachers um, and all the students were male. And at that time, um, the only other, uh, I think, woman in the college was a woman who worked in administration. So that was incredibly tough, but you know, um, my view about getting a job when I was um, not able to get a job in the secondary system because I was married by that time and had to wait because uh, I couldn't be transferred um, to a regional setting, um, I found this job in TAFE and I was going to keep it, mm. basically. So, so that's um, for me, um, I, I, I have a bit of a steely will um, and that's really placed me in good stead. I've often been the only woman or the first woman in a number of, of roles, first woman director general in the Department of um, Education, first woman in state development, um, second woman in treasury, second woman in JAG, Justice and Attorney General, first woman um, head of TAFE, first woman public service commissioner and everyone, and I don't say that as a list of merit, I say it um, that every woman who's been in a senior role and is the first woman in those roles, uh, including first woman in the role of um, Director General of the Department of the Premier and Cabinet, you, you carry an extra load because mm -hmm. you can't fail. You can't be perceived to fail. And it was more acute, I think, in the earlier days in my career uh, when there were fewer women um, in senior roles and you had that sense of responsibility um, to demonstrate that, you know, women can do anything. Mm. And how did you then, um, because I think that's, you know, these are high pressure roles anyway, um, but with that extra layer of of pressure that you're sort of internalising about, well, you know, I can't fail here. How do you manage that? And also, how do you um, define failure? Mm. So I think the first part is these are jobs for teams. Mm. 
and you, you have to understand that. Mm. Um, you know, the notion of an all-being, all-seeing, all-knowing director general is silly. Uh, you, you have to have a team of people working with you who likewise build teams and build teams. So an organisation is a construct of connected teamwork. Um, so that, that's how you mitigate that, that fear of failure, which, you know, can be really acute um, for everyone, a high-performing, um, aspiring, uh, not to fail mm. sort of value is um, can be crippling for mm. people so it, it's a job for teams um, sorry the second part of your and question. I also was interested um, to know what what failure is um, in your mind um, it, it has many facets um, I think failure to deliver against expectations is and that can be political expectations but Often departments have responsibility for leading pol big policy shifts, um, implementing new service models. So a failure to execute mm. well uh, and to bring people with you. Um, that that um, injudicious um, behaviour or comments mm. um, in you know what is a political environment um, in the public sector, um, you know. We, we have to ensure that we uphold the confidence of the community in the integrity of the public sector. Mm. And so the way we role model leadership behaviours uh, is very important. Mm. And we were talking before about, um, I guess, expectations and also um, an ability to execute as well as um, now we're reflecting on that not going um, so well. How important um, is it um, that you have an ability to, to, to be your own judge, mm -hmm. that you can, um, you know, acknowledge when, when you ha There must have been times where you've looked at yeah. things and thought, I, you know, that wasn't done. Mm -hmm. If I did it again, I'd do it differently. differently yeah. um, and there'd probably also been times where you've copped criticism but you know you don't you you've done a good job and you need to stick to that so how important is it that you hold on to your own sense of um what success and failure look like i think you, you develop a confidence um in that in terms of your intuitive ability to know when to fail fast um uh, and when to to hold the course mm. Um, a lot of that comes from experience mm. and luckily um, most of us build that experience up as we come through mm. the ranks. So failure as a you know, mid-level manager might be far less impactful on an organisation than failure at the level of a director general. Mm. So you, you build that experience. I think um, one, of the, one of the hallmarks of a good leader is humility mm. and understanding that we don't always get it right. Um, you mitigate the risk of getting it wrong, as I said, by working with a team. You take feedback. Mm. Um, some leaders have, you know, this sense that they have to make the call. And yes, ultimately accountability sits with the CEO, mm. in our case, Director General. Mm. That goes without saying. but. You need to road test your ideas and you need to take feedback and listen and synthesise that so that you mitigate those risks. Mm. Having said that, things can still go wrong and, and just making sure that you're surveilling the territory and you're acutely aware of what's happening and make the call, make the call quickly mm. to redirect, change tack, uh, own failure mm. um, is, is really important. Mm. This is going to sound like a very trite question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, because you are have been the first woman in so many different really important roles, um, could you make some comments on, on what you think um, women bring to leadership roles? I think... Um, women bring um, a level of um, 
anxiety. So I'm not going to start with a positive. Um, you know, that, that sense of responsibility, which means that, um, you know, these, these are big jobs and the workloads are significant, mm. but I've seen many women come into these roles and, and they give 200%. And, mm. and at some point, um, while you know, we all work hard, that balance issue becomes, it becomes even more tortured, I think, for women because they often have that primary nurturing, you know, family custodial mm. <laughs> set of responsibilities. So um, rewarding people for overworking, in a sense, to mm. the detriment of their own well-being is, is something I really, really work not to do, mm. to, to acknowledge that there, there are limits in terms of expectations on people and take care of people. I think that's really important. Women, I think, are far more acutely aware of, of those issues for others. Mm. I think they bring an empathy mm. um, to the role. That's not to say no, men don't. Uh, I've worked with some highly empathetic male leaders. Mm. But I think more universally, women are more aware of the complexities that surround people's ability to come to work, focus on work, um, while maintaining healthy lives outside work. Mm. Um, I think women are, um, by their nature, uh, operate a little more on intuition. Now, um, that I think, I think women are people studiers. Mm. Um, and again, whether that talks to a stereotype, I apologise if that's the case, but they seem to be uh, just uh, more able to read people. Mm. Um, and that's perhaps because often women are more passive observers of mm. process and people in lots of organisations and with that comes an inherent wisdom that mm. builds up over time. And I guess following on from that, because, um, you know, in 1977 when you started your career and walked in and realised you were the only, uh, not just female on staff, but also all of the students were male, um, if you were walked into that workplace now, it would be very different. Yeah. And um, many of these workplaces that you've trailblazed through would look different now. You know, mm. there's women in leadership roles in, in many of those organisations. Uh, I, I guess then thinking about those, uh, reflecting on the comments you've made about um, what make, you know, how being a woman makes leadership, you know, what we bring to leadership as women, then could you comment on, on what you've seen in terms of organisational culture change um, as a result of having women over time in leadership roles? I think um, at, at it, in its essence we're seeing um, that shift towards a greater recognition that um, people have lives outside work. Mm -hmm. I think that work-life balance issue has been important to recognise not only for women but for, for men. Uh, there's been a democratisation of the workplace over time. Part of that's been industrial. Part of that's been because of the diversity mm. that we are now seeing um, in contemporary organisations. I think um, women are um, more um, adept at communicating um, ar around the needs of a workforce. Mm. Um, they're, as we said earlier, um, in tune. Um, and, and all of that has contributed to really important discussions, most recently around psychosocial safety, mm. for example, in workplaces. Now, that, that's betterment for everyone. Um, and the greater the diversity in the workplace, the more voices that are heard, and I think the better decisions that are made. So I'm going to shift a little bit away um, from leadership and talk a little bit more about your your um, current role and mm -hmm. some of the work um, that you're doing. One of the things I think that's really interesting about um, Department of Prime, um, Premier and Cabinet is um, that you have um, particular 
portfolio areas within that central agency. So you have a social policy yep. um, part to the department. Can you talk to me a little bit about the role of that function within um, Premier's and then how that connects to um, the other sort of human services functions like community services, like housing, like health, like child protection, youth justice? Yeah. So the, the, the role is diverse. So we have our policy group, um, let's talk social policy, but obviously you have economic policy, environmental policy, legal policy, etc. Um, but, but in the social policy space, the role um, includes um, providing advice to government on submissions that ministers bring forward for consideration by Cabinet. Uh, it involves initiating um, policy thinking with agencies. So we have um, robust interdepartmental policy forums that, uh, so DPC is not just a reactive um, policy advisor, DPC initiates mm. um, policy uh, thinking, discussion uh, and strategy for consideration by government. Uh, we have a, a key role in bringing interconnection to policy which is really important because often um, policy runs up and down vertically rather than horizontally. Um, and so discrete agencies are responsible for policies that are pertinent to their domain. But many of the social issues that we grapple with as a community and are grappling with require interdepartmental policy thinking. So can we take housing as an example? Sure. Um, so we saw um, definitely last year um, the Premier take a greater role in mm. responding to the housing crisis in Queensland and hold um, roundtables and a housing summit um, and then you know the policy work that flows out of that obviously has a, a cross department focus with a, a leadership group that includes state development, um, treasury, premiers, housing. Um, can you talk a little bit ha about the, the mechanics of how um, premiers becomes sort of a lead agency in, in responding to the housing crisis? So, you know, the role of a first minister's department is to stand up capability when there's a issue that clearly requires whole of government response or multiple agency responses and housing is a good example. So we actually stood up a group of people who worked with the relevant agencies to deliver the housing summit and from that summit to generate the work program that was delivered, uh, developed through the discussions and decisions taken at that summit. So in many senses we have a coordination function but we also um, have a program management office function. So ensuring that agencies are meeting their obligations in terms of the responsibilities they have as a consequence of that um, whole of government decision making. The housing delivery board was stood up, mm. for example, that has multiple agencies at the table looking at unlocking available land, ensuring that planning approvals are more fluid, flexible um, and agile, ensuring that the investment that's provided both for emergency housing, homelessness strategy, um, housing, social housing and affordable housing are coordinated and agencies are working together. Mm -hmm. Standing up a discrete housing portfolio, again, talks to the importance of uh, that coordination of work and much of the responsibility for coordinating that works now sits with that portfolio but we still hold a program management office responsibility. Right. So we've had um, a question from the audience about the government's response, well a few questions from the mm. audience about the government's response to the housing crisis. Um, one of them um, is about um, what our ambition should be as a state when it comes to housing and homelessness and 
um, the question is, uh, should we set an ambition of, um, you know, I've heard the Premier say every Queenslander deserves a roof over their head. And the question is, should we be setting that as our, our collective ambition or is that um, so, um, so ambitious, uh, so big, hairy and audacious that we're setting ourselves up for uh, failure and disappointment? Oh, I just think um, we are an incredibly... Um, wealthy, um, well governed in terms of um, governance, um, state. Um, we have all of the resources that we need. We have a robust community sector working in partnership. It should be absolute that every Queenslander has access to safe, secure, affordable housing because that's a fundamental platform for them, uh, for every Queenslander, to then be able to engage in socially and economically in a very prosperous state. So the, the issue of governance I raise because it's really important. Um, government alone can't deliver the outcomes that, that we would, that outcome. We have to work in partnership, have to work in partnership with um, the community sector, we have to work in partnership with the business sector, the construction sector, um, you know, the, in, the financing and investment that's required brings capital into um, housing construction. All of that is, is fundamental. Um, and what, what is at the heart of good governance around delivering on that ambition is um, the strategy we all own, all the strategies we all own, and how well coordinated they are mm. across government and out across our partners and stakeholders. So um, I guess following on from that, um, another question is, um, you know, if we accept that we're in a housing crisis and, um, you know, some research from the University of New South Wales shows that around 300,000 Queenslanders currently have unmet housing need, which means um, that they are uh, people on low incomes that are spending more than 30% of their income on um, housing, which puts them in housing stress, and we know we need to do more to address mm. that. Uh, so we have this sort of crisis. Uh, we have rents increasing. We don't have enough supply uh, of affordable and social housing. And then we have an ambition to put a roof over the head of mm. every person. Uh, the question is, we're really good in Queensland at dealing with crisis. So uh, when we have an extreme weather event, we have a really good processes that can be stood up and um, worked on to, to respond to the crisis uh, and get us uh, sort of into recovery um, and, um, and um, back on track. The question is, uh, if we're in a housing crisis, why is the government not standing up a, a crisis response uh, to housing? I think in a sense we have. I think that the housing summit provided uh, a, an opportunity for all of the various um, interests in terms of ensuring every Queenslander has a roof over their head to come together to, to talk to what needed to happen. I think everyone would accept that we are, you know, in this really um, difficult transition period coming out of COVID where um, we, we, no one could have anticipated the impact that this has had, both in terms of um, housing supply, uh, the cost of housing, mm. the impact on rentals and, and the displacement effect that that has had across the housing continuum. So. Um, what's the crisis response? The crisis response has been a significant investment in um, emergency housing, in homelessness strategy, in um, emergency response to people uh, who are at risk of losing uh, that roof over their head, trying to keep them in that property um, for people who are you know, really at the other end of the homelessness continuum, people who are literally sleeping rough, mm. um, that, you know, rapid response teams, the sort of work the department's doing with um, NGOs to literally 
find people and bring them into accommodation. The rapid development of that 194 additional um, dwellings, units for people who are at that extreme end of homelessness. Um, all of those responses are trying to keep that roof over people's heads while we unlock the supply pipeline. Um, and, and certainly, you know, that work is, is underway. Um, there's, you know, if, as I, we said before, if there was an easy, quick solution to this, um, you know, we would have found it. We would have found it together. But we have to work together. And absolutely, I respect the, you know, the concerns that the NGO sector, the community sector are expressing around where we are. Uh, the reality is we are here mm. and we have to try to protect um, the most vulnerable um, while we stimulate the housing supply pipeline. Mm. Uh, I, I, and I think that we have the, the governance models in place to be able to be held to account for the work that we're doing, mm. um, but also to keep learning from the intelligence of particularly the community sector, mm. around what they're seeing. So I guess another um, big significant social policy issue that um, we've all been paying a lot of attention to, particularly in the last six, six months or so, um, is youth justice. And um, I think, you know, our members uh, certainly uh, have a, a pretty consistent view that um, you know, the investment needs to be made in early intervention and prevention mm -hmm. um, so that we don't, um, you know, we are building two new prisons, um, which is an expensive response mm -hmm. to crime. Um, I know we've talked about this before, needing, you know, the difficult work of moving the investment from the crisis end to the early intervention end. How, mm. how do we do that and how long will it take? Yeah, I think, I think the answer to that is it, 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 it requires um, an, an, an evidence base and, um, and we were talking earlier about the importance of evaluation to determine um, what is working in terms of early intervention. Mm. There are a whole range of early intervention programs already being funded and delivered largely in partnership with um, NGOs, um, not exclusively, but a number of government agencies are also delivering those programs. What we know is that many of these children have come from highly complex backgrounds. Uh, many of them have experienced, as have their families, intergenerational trauma and poverty. Um, so the, the wraparound services are really services that have to wrap around the whole family um, and ensure that the siblings of children who've intersected with the YJ youth justice system don't necessarily just follow in that path. Mm -hmm. We have some of those early intervention models in place, particularly in communities where we've seen greater levels of uh, youth crime. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of those communities are regionally based. Um, a, a number of those programs have to be culturally sensitive, uh, where we're dealing with children from diverse backgrounds. So the, it's the evaluation that, that will inform the success of those programs. And we are seeing um, from early in evaluation data, signs of success with some of those programs. They have to incorporate responses from a, education, health, youth justice, sometimes police, um, the community sector. So they are really um, all encompassing in terms of the complexity of services that are required to wrap around those children to ensure their best chance of not continuing down a path of, of offending and, and um, an escalation of the violence of that offending. That's what we're trying to address. Yeah. So across your career, Rachel, you would have seen um, lots of, um, I guess, cultural shifts and um, hopefully um, 
the curve of history bending towards progress in some ways. Can you reflect to me on some of the really big um, changes that you've seen in your career in, from a social policy perspective? Sure. Um, I think, um, you know, I'll go, I'll go track back to my natural home, which is education. Um, that investment in um, the reintroduction of PrEP um, you know, that preparatory year for schooling, which, you know, we in many years, decades before, we had the infant school, which was ultimately um, disbanded. So that, that knowledge, that, that investment in um, early learning and the fundamental importance of that, particularly for children from disadvantaged backgrounds, um, low SES backgrounds, uh, the research is so compelling. So I think that was that was, you know, such a significant step forward for mm. Queensland and for Queensland children. Um, likewise, when I was out of government, I had the opportunity to work um, in the early childhood education and care um, space, establishing the, um, in the implementation of the national quality framework. So, so for me, mm. um, the earlier we can provide children uh, an opportunity to participate in quality early learning, mm. um, the, the greater the opportunity we have to have them ready for more formalised learning uh, as they enter school. And that, that is a critical measure of success in terms of their ongoing learning. Um, when I was in the justice um, portfolio, uh, we established a number of specialist courts um, Murray Courts, for example, uh, and um, I later, when I was out of government, was the chair of Legal Aid Queensland, and we could see the benefits of working uh, with specialist courts, um, ensuring that you know the, the right supports, again, were wrapped around people as they presented uh, to court. Um, I think um, if you switch lanes and... and talk about um, the, my time in state development um, and treasury, although they're economic portfolios, I, I just don't think we can ever discount the importance of industry development, economic development in terms of social impact. Mm. So creating opportunities to participate in new industries, mm. um, in jobs that are secure and well paid mm. and um, jobs that leverage investment in education are fundamentally important to social outcomes. And so I, I see a much stronger nexus between economic and social policy mm. as a consequence of the career opportunities I've had. Yeah. So I guess um, a question following on from that is um, for our members, um, community organisations, I think, uh, you know, a... a a spot we like to be in is a spot where we're partnering with government mm. to have um, really powerful, a really powerful impact in our community. Although we, you know, our independence is obviously also important so that we can provide um, a view of what's happening in the community that is um, independent from government as mm. well. Um, Rachel, have you seen examples of um, where the community sector has worked with government to have that sort of impact or where the community sector's advice to government has had a really fundamental impact on the things that government has gone on to do? I think we're living it now, to be, to be honest. I think um, the answer's in, in short, absolutely. And I think um, particularly if you look at um, the role of the community sector in the um, child safety space. Mm. Um, the community sector has played a key instrumental role in mm. shaping policy um, around the protection of children. Mm. Um, I think in the youth justice space, um, the community sector has and, and is mm. playing a real role in mm. terms of shaping our response um, to our current circumstance mm. with young violent offenders um, and understanding the genesis and therefore the response that's required mm. and certainly in the housing space for a long period of time. Mm. 
the community sector has played an influential role and I think wants a, a stronger role. Mm. And I think, uh, you know, I hope mm. uh, the sector feels we are listening mm. and that we are partnering. Mm. Um, the relationship with, with NGOs more generally, um, you know, if I reflect back in my career, um, was uh, largely almost a contractual procurement relationship. Mm. It has so far matured from that. Mm. Government can't do in so many sectors what it needs to do without that partnership. Mm. So, you know, that's certainly a commitment that, that we give. Mm. And um, at times the relationship is uncomfortable. Mm. And, you know, that, that is in the nature of um, any partnership and relationship. Mm that sometimes we we hear uncomfortable truths mm. and um, and sometimes we provide feedback mm. that's less than one would have expected. But having sufficient robustness in the partnership helps us trade through. Mm. So uh, we got a relevant um, question from the audience uh, about sort of that relationship between um, government and the NGO sector and, and um, I guess it goes to that sort of evolution of the relationship mm -hmm. where we you sort of reflected that um, at the beginning of your career it was much more of a transactional um, procurement based relationship and it has evolved from that and this question is I guess going back to that contractual procurement part which is to say and and um, QCOS has been out on the road in the last um, few weeks and months um, meeting with our members across Queensland and um, one of the themes that I've heard really strongly um, this year is um, feedback from our members to say if we are delivering a service or a support to our community over the long term and if we have proven that we are uh, delivering on that, that we are, we are needed in our community, mm -hmm. that our service will continue to be required and that we are um, at the right standard. Why don't we move away from um, relationships where we only have, um, you know, one year, two year, five year, seven year contracts and actually move to a model where we are engaged by government to deliver an essential service uh, and the relationship becomes more about our quality and our impact in the community as opposed to uh, regardless of how well we do, um, we might be not funded after that period of that contract. Mm. And, and, you know, we've, we've you know, tried to move to slightly uh, longer term funding agreements over time, you know, away from... And I know some, some of your members will have just signed up for another 12 months um, on the back of the Commonwealth extending, say, the National Housing mm -hmm. Agreement mm -hmm. for 12 months. Um, some part of that complexity around the term of funding agreements goes to the extent to which we are co-reliant on other funding sources, for example, um, national partnership agreements funded by the Commonwealth. Uh, and that I guess helps us mitigate the uh, fiscal exposure of mm. the state should the Commonwealth withdraw or reduce um, that funding agreement. Mm. Um, so I, I have great sympathy. I understand the argument, um, uh, the, the, the issue particularly in a circumstance where skills are in short supply, the risk of losing people um, becomes more acute, obviously, mm. when, you know, we're moving from funding agreement term by term, um, particularly where the term is less than three years. We've tried to move to a standard of three-year funding cycles, as you know. Um, I don't have a solution. I'm sorry. It's, it does come down to the state trying to manage its fiscal exposures as well. But please be assured people are sensitive to this and we're where we're in a position to be able to extend the funding term. Um, there's certainly a, a strong will to do that. So I think it was this year, wasn't it, that um, your contract was renewed and you were reappointed for another how many years? Three years. Another three years. Um, can you 
give me a picture of, um, you know, thinking forward mm -hmm. um, with that optimistic yet pragmatic view that you have. Uh, in the next three years, what are the things um, that you would really love to see done? Mm -hmm. But then um, even projecting further forward, uh, what's your vision for Queensland in the future? Okay. So um, can I start with the second one first? Yeah. Because that's really the driver. I mean, DPC's vision, uh, and we spent a lot of time um, as, our, as a staff um, and an executive talking about the role of the Department of the Premier and Cabinet in the context of the vision for Queensland. And so we ended up in a place where we said, well, we contribute to a Queensland that's thriving, inclusive and envied for our lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the latter talks to our, you know, biodiversity and our, you know, our custodial role for the, the beauty um, that the Queensland landscape affords us. Um, uh, but a lifestyle that, that um, is not a lifestyle of hardship, it's a lifestyle, it may not be an, a, a lifestyle of huge affluence, that's not necessarily success either, but mm. you know, the cost of living drivers um, that, you know, and pressures that people are experiencing now you know, the state has, you know, a, a responded through concessions around or subsidies around um, power and um, the free kindy program and a whole range of subsidi subsidies that are available to um, older people, uh, vulnerable people, people who are welfare dependent. So, so for me, um, equity matters mm -hmm. and and you know, whether it's talking to um, uh, Treaty and, you know, the incredible work that Queensland is doing to reconcile um, the wrongs of the past in terms of um, our First Nations peoples. Uh, I hope we've moved a long way down that path, Amy. That would be my principal objective and view that that there is such opportunity for us uh, in that space. The issues we've been talking about, youth justice, housing, um, that, that we will see real purposeful gains um, in, in those areas of social policy such that we see much reduced rates of offending and re-offending. Um, we we realise the vision um, of a roof over Queenslanders' heads. Um, I think that they're real um, and tangible and possible outcomes from the plans and the work and the dedication and the perseverance that I see in um, agencies leading that work. Rachel, Thank you so much for this conversation. It's, it's been um, such a delight and um, thank you uh, for sharing some of that, those um, sort of guiding principles um, that you received from your mother. And um, thank you for talking about your mum because I think um, so many of us have that, don't we? That's where we get the sense of who we are and um, what our values are. So. It's really lovely to, to reflect on that in the context of um, being a woman in leadership and sort of pay that um, respect to our mothers. So uh, thank you for doing that. Thank, um, you. thank you all so much uh, for attending uh, the conversation uh, this afternoon. I also just wanted to thank QUT Centre for Justice for working in partnership with QCOS to bring this conversation. Uh, to you. If leadership is um, something you want to delve into more, QCOS is currently uh, in the process of rolling out some um, leadership training and capacity building events and you can find out uh, more information on our website. Uh, thanks again Rachel and thank you, thank you to all of you. Uh, have a wonderful afternoon.